gentlemen. Uh, my name is Richard Levy. Uh, I'm a partner here at Media UK and head the uh, Israel desk. And I'm delighted to welcome you all here this morning for a not so early event, uh, BDO in conjunction with the UK uh, Israel business. Uh, I received a call last week from our colleagues in BDO in Israel, from Eitan Young, who, who's here in the, uh, in the audience this morning, heads of the financial cluster and the fintech cluster in BDO in Israel, uh, to say that their good friends, Yoni uh, Asian and uh, Moore, were here in, in the UK this week and would we like to host an event and I must say we grabbed the opportunity because uh, I think uh, the fact that we've managed to get so many people at such short notice gives testament to the fact that people want to hear what, what you want to say. So we're delighted that you're here this morning and thank you for giving us the opportunity to host you. Uh, BDO has a, a lot of experience across the globe. Uh, in both crypto and the ICO market and, and the wider uh, blockchain space. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity as regulations develop uh, in, in what is really a truly dynamic market, so obviously in the legal, in the tech space, in the, in, in the accounting and, and tax space, uh, particularly in the UK, in Gibraltar, South Korea, the US, Switzerland, and of course in Israel. Uh, and we're having discussions on a daily basis uh, with businesses searching for advice on ICOs and looking for support as they scale up. Uh, our crypto clients include the, the likes of CryptoCompare.com, Funfair, Pantera, Pantera Capital, CoCoin, and Bitsum. Here in London, David Butcher, who's a partner in our uh, tech team, uh, it leads BDO's offering and personally has a number of clients in the area. David's in the back there. Uh, and also here this morning is Jason Gross-Chalk, who heads our cybersecurity space. He was here before, but he may have just, just dashed out of the room. And of course, delighted to welcome Eitan uh, from uh, BDO in Israel. And we're all looking forward to what I'm sure will be a fascinating discussion this morning. Over to you guys. Well, thank you very much, Richard, for hosting us. And I've got to say at the same time that Richard had a phone call from his Israeli colleagues, I had a phone call from Moore's colleagues. And we thought it would absolutely be a great opportunity to host both Moore and Yoni. It's very, I think it's the first time that UK Israel Business has hosted a husband and a wife running two very different businesses, both within the sort of finance sector. And believe it or not, I think Moni, Yoni and Moore are actually on holiday here. But as Moore said to me earlier, it wouldn't be a it wouldn't be pleasure without business and so um before we start i just i know there's quite a few people here that have not been to a uk israel business event before so i hope you'll indulge us by if i show you a very short movie about uk israel business and then we'll kick off um yoni's going to present first around um crypto and um, blockchain and then more is going to present and then we're going to have a bit of a conversation so i'll just fire up this video and then UK Israel Business operates as a not-for-profit. We've been going since 1950. Its legacy was in the old historic Chamber of Commerce world. And many of us who engage with UK Israel Business do so because of our connection with Israel as a destination. Well, I think firstly, the UK is one of the, the biggest markets on the doorstep of Israel. So it's an attractive place for many Israeli companies to come and sell goods, products, services, and also to raise money. Going back the other way, companies in the UK, larger industrial companies are looking for ways to develop and grow through technological innovation and Israel is a fantastic hub for that. The aim is to really increase the trade, the investment and the growth of business between the two countries. To forge better links between the two economies, both on a personal level, on an enterprise level, and on an intellectual level. And I think it tries to do that in many different ways. The idea is to promote trade, to create more connections, get more business done, and strengthen both ecosystems by creating new friendships and partnerships. An organization that facilitates, encourages, promotes, and introduces opportunities, trade, activities, and uh, investments between the UK and Israel. 
we are perhaps the only organisation really doing that in a meaningful way, having four, five, six delegations each year. We have tremendous access to companies uh, in the technology sectors, but also in prop tech, in shore tech and various others. You'll not only hear from entrepreneurs and from business leaders, you'll hear from academics, you'll hear from politicians, you'll hear from thought leaders. So it's the events, it's the networking the situations, and it's very focused with like-minded sector professionals or even competitors and I want to look at interesting opportunities. Well, I think one of our challenges and, and focus areas is very much around broadening our network and bringing people that maybe don't have Israel on their radar currently uh, and, and, and bringing them into the fold. The first time I went to Israel, the latest technology was avocados. It was an agricultural nation. Today, of course, it's one, if not the leading technical nation in the world. The two countries are very complementary today. At the end of the day, as Israel grows as an economy, as its companies develop, those companies need investment and insight from the UK. A lot of those companies benefit. I think the UK Israel business plays a vital role in serving as that bridge between the two. Because we're not government, because we very much operate as a two-way street, it gives us the ability and the independence to enable things to happen. An organization like that can promote and help business, especially in early stage, get you in touch with the right people, making the right introductions, and generally speaking, giving you a smooth entrance to the market. Israel is now thought of alongside some of the most dynamic, interesting, growing economies. At the end, people are the most important thing, okay? In this business, like in many others, helping people from Israel to come to UK and vice versa to exchange ideas and uh, build things together is the most successful way to do that. Thank you for indulging us with the video. Um, it's now a real pleasure to invite um, Yoni Asir to speak first. Yoni um, is the founder of eToro and most recently just um, completed a $100 million capital raising um, for the company and has a lot to say. He is often known as Mr. Crypto, Mr. Blockchain in Israel, and I know he's also seeded a number of companies in the space. So Yoni, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, what I wanted actually to talk about is a bit about uh, cryptocurrencies, <coughs> Bitcoin, Toro is today uh, the largest social trading network in the world with over 10 million members who can trade stocks, commodities, currencies, and cryptocurrencies, and everybody can actually see, follow, and copy each other. But let's uh, first, uh, for me to understand who's in the room, how many people here actually uh, have heard about Bitcoin? <laughs> How many people heard about Ethereum? How many people actually own Bitcoin or Ethereum? That's very, very, very impressive. Um, and I want to talk about the first sort of very macro. Why is the revolution so important? And then I'm going to talk about crypto as an asset class, uh, both from a generational point of view and a portfolio management point of view. Uh, and the reason this is so important is because from a technology point of view, this is the reinvention of money. So if you think about money in general, uh, it is one of the biggest inventions in human history. And a lot of the global commerce around the world has basically been based on the fact that people started using uh, gold as the base commodity or the base currency of the world. So people were able to move from only village trade to global trading to inter-village trade in the past through having a local common denominator. Because when you just had a local currency, a local barter system, you couldn't really expand that overseas. So the whole expansion overseas of basically humanity, uh, the sort of entrance into the new world uh, uh, back uh, five, six hundred years ago was all based eventually on the fact that people could ship gold across the seas in ships and create global commerce. And of course today when we think about money, there is relatively a status quo that money is government money or is fiat money, which basically means it's printed through the government, through local banks which are regulated and in their computers, but of course 
that has also not been uh, the case forever. That is a, a recent change in the last 150 years, basically, uh, federated money or central bank money. Um, and I'm saying that because these things change with technology. And this is based on uh, long-standing research of why gold acted as sound money, and it has all of these uh, different qualities of scarcity, divisibility, portability, durability, uh, the fact it's recognizable and fungible, and that's sort of from a lot of research across hundreds of years of why gold was able to act uh, as sound money. And what we're seeing now basically is an invention. Uh, it's a technology invention, which in my opinion is as important as the invention of electricity, computers, and the internet, which is basically digital money. It is the first time that we have a native uh, digital asset or native digital financial asset where people can actually hold the financial asset themselves. So I have on my phone here my private keys to just a small portion of my Bitcoin, so don't try to uh, kidnap me. Um, and uh, when you have that on your phone, that means you have complete control over those Bitcoins. So you can basically send and receive them to anywhere around the world without an intermediary. And I just, I'd like to compare this because the same as technology revolution, uh, uh, which is electricity and the internet and computers, there's also another revolution uh, that we've seen happening over the last couple of hundred years, uh, which is very relevant, and that's democracy and freedom of speech. So imagine a world where in order to communicate with someone else, you need to actually go to an intermediary. You need to tell that intermediary your message. He will then take that message and transfer it to someone else and that is the only way to communicate. So you can't move information from one person to another. You have to pass that information through a regulated financial intermediary. That's basically how money moves around the world. Everything has to move through financial intermediaries and we couldn't conceive how to do that with information. And that's exactly the revolution that we're seeing now, is the reinvention of money as something that potentially can free flow as free as information. And that has very serious, obviously, implication also on a government level, global commerce, uh, etc. Um, and, of course, when you think about Bitcoin, Bitcoin is scarce. There's only 21 million Bitcoins to ever be minted. Uh, it's divisible, so you can take Bitcoin and slice it up. Uh, as much as you want almost, and it's portable, so it's on my phone here. It's very easy to shift Bitcoin from one place to another across the world. Uh, it's durable, and here in this case, so for example, <coughs> carrots or potatoes were not durable as uh, sound money, and Bitcoin obviously is, and the reason is, is the decentralization of how Bitcoin is basically built. So nobody controls Bitcoin, there aren't servers, anywhere holding Bitcoin, uh, and generally it's impossible to basically take it down or stop it. So the network will work because a lot of people are running in uh, the network. Basically, it's as strong as the last person believing or using a Bitcoin wallet. Um, and of course, uh, it's recognizable, so it's math. So this is basically if regular money is based on the fact that you believe in the government issuing that money, in the regulation of that system and in the banking system, in the case of cryptocurrency, you just need to believe math. You just need to believe the technical aspects of how this works. So this is more science than a sort of a, a government. Uh, and that's a very big difference because Bitcoin is Bitcoin because you agree what Bitcoin is, and you run a software that speaks Bitcoin and uses the Bitcoin protocol, and that defines what Bitcoin is. So therefore, it's easily recognizable, uh, basically through computer sciences, uh, and fungible, again, is a key feature uh, of Bitcoin itself. Now, a lot of people that even buy Bitcoin don't necessarily understand the 
technological <coughs> importance of this invention. The importance of this invention is to be able to create basically communities or networks of people who agree on a certain value and can transfer that value between them without a central authority. And the reason that's super important, by the way, especially for financial services, is because, for example, when you need to transfer a financial asset between five different companies, you will usually have, uh, for each of the five companies, basically a database recording that financial assets, their assets and the liabilities. They'll have to hire BDO to figure out what do they have under their assets and liabilities. And every time something moves in that, it needs to move in those five different databases which makes the entire life of moving assets actually quite complex and requires the need of lawyers and accountants <coughs> to move complex assets. This technology enables you to issue those assets on top of blockchains and to transfer them seamlessly, uh, basically without the need of reconciliation. So instead of using five database and hiring lawyers and accountants to understand <coughs> where things are, Again, computer science has solved that. You can look at one blockchain, at one database, and see where everything is. Now, who here understands how blockchain works? <laughs> Perfect, much less. You also won't understand after this lecture, because I don't have enough time. Um, but generally, um, blockchain is a decentralized database. So blockchain basically is a ledger. So my grandfather actually started a bank before there were computers. Uh, which is mind-blowing if you think how the hell do you run a bank before there are computers. And the way they actually did it, he had people who sit with clients and have a ledger and write down on the ledger at every movement. So the customer went to the bank and he wrote on the ledger the movements. Then at a certain time in the day, all of the people in the branch went and the master ledger came to collect all of the ledger and created this master ledger of all of the ledgers in the bank to basically reconcile between everything within the branch and everything external from the branch. Then they went and aggregated all of the ledgers of all of the branches into the central branch where somebody actually sat with all of the branches' ledgers and reconciled it, made sure that all of the transfers actually made sense, and those were the books of the bank for the day. And that was a very tedious process in the past, but that is basically how blockchain works. It's simply an open ledger, and what the technology does is if each of us has a Bitcoin wallet, it has one address, and that address has only one thing, how many Bitcoins are in that address. And it's decentralized because we're all basically using the same database, but it's on our phone, so basically we each keep a copy of the ledger. So there's no one single person who has the ledger. Each of us copy, uh, have a copy of that ledger, which includes how many Bitcoins every single person here in the room has. We don't know, by the way, which name. We just see addresses and the number of Bitcoins. And what happens is, in order, instead of having one person in the room having that ledger, which is like the master branch uh, or the basically ledger of the entire bank, there's what's called the algorithm of mining and consensus. And what happens is each of us has the ledger and every single block, which happens in Bitcoin every about eight minutes, we all send each other all of our ledgers. So a ledger obviously is something digital. So we all send and say, here are all of the transactions that we've seen across the room being done between all of the people. And every time you see a transaction that you haven't seen, you add it to the block the block of the blockchain is the difference between the last ledger and all of the transactions that happened between the last ledger and the next ledger. Now, by everybody here in the room is sending everyone that update, that block on all of the transactions that happened. And then there's what's called the mining process, which is also how Bitcoins are being minted uh, or created. And everybody here tries to be the person who says, this is the last block. So everybody here takes the last block, puts it in an envelope. We all put it here on the table as the next block. So these are basically each of us say, these are all of the transactions that happened since the last uh, block. 
and the next block, we all put it here, and then basically, and that's the mining algorithm, there's sort of a reshuffle of all of those envelopes. We pull one envelope, whoever we chose the envelope of gets actually a reward of 25 bitcoins, and the way to do it is what's called mining and how people build now mining farms, etc. And then I shout, who goes envelope was actually the envelope we will decide as the next block. And therefore now we all add it to the ledger. So think about it as a page of the ledger. Now this is the last page of the ledger and we start this process again. And the reason from a mathematics point of view that this works is because you can't cheat. And the reason you can't cheat, because every time we do this raffle, nobody knows who's gonna get picked to be the next block producer. Okay, so how many people now understand how blockchain works? Less. <laughs> As I expected. Um, but that's generally how it works. So it's, a, it's basically a mathematical way uh, to build a distributed ledger where everybody can actually read from that ledger and write from that ledger without the need of a centralized authority. And what it does, so on the internet, we all have your emails and internet, etc. It's all based on uh, basically a technology called TCPIP, which was invented, I think, in the late 70s, early 80s, and started basically this entire internet. This is TCPIP for money. So when I saw the internet for the first time in 93, I was excited about this new technology. When I saw Bitcoin in 2011, the same excitement. This is, again, a technological revolution of how things work. It led me to actually buy Bitcoin for Etoro in 2011, where my board actually wanted to kill me because of it. Um, now less. Um, okay, so just very, very quickly. So Bitcoin is an agreement of how to read and write from a public ledger where we all agree on it. But today when people talk about cryptocurrencies, it's already way beyond Bitcoin. How, how many people here own something more than just Bitcoin? Okay, so probably Ethereum is your first choice, hopefully not Ripple. Um, and basically all of these crypto assets each have different features. I will not go into all of the different features. What is interesting, especially when we think, when we're in the offices of BDO, uh, and we think about the, the UK market of uh, lawyers, uh, then Ethereum actually takes that a step further. So. If the first version of blockchains were about the reinvention of money, Ethereum and smart contracts basically say, let's create a ledger, but that ledger doesn't o o only include <coughs> my, uh, my account and how many Bitcoins I own. It includes my account and all of the contracts, all of the agreements that I've ever agreed to or written with any participant here in the room. Okay, so think about now a general ledger. Instead of having for every account only how many Bitcoins it holds, on Ethereum, every account now has a list of all of the agreements that might have future deals like options, forwards, swaps, any type of basically future agreement, anything you can write in logic and code with all of the participants in the network, which in theory means that in a, if, if the entire world ran on Ethereum, you didn't have to have a judicial system because all of the agreements were written in code and therefore could be, a, could be decided upon a computer code. And therefore, in theory, you don't need lawyers or the judicial system because everything that you have agreed upon is a smart contract. It is a contract <coughs> that all of the logic has been defined within the contract and therefore it's finite. Uh, I won't go into the details of that, uh, but each of the cryptocurrencies basically have different features and the different features are really about is this cryptocurrency sub has new features like smart contracts in Ethereum, the level of decentralization, can governments block this cryptocurrencies, can people sue the company behind this cryptocurrency? In the case, for example, of Bitcoin, no, nobody can sue Bitcoin because there is no Bitcoin. There's no person behind Bitcoin. No government can shut it down because there's no entity behind it. On Ripple, on the other hand, there's a company in the US that owns 60% of the Ripple in the world. So in theory, 
the US or FBI could go into their offices and take that 60% from them. So which makes Ripple a much more centralized cryptocurrency, but Ripple does that to actually connect banks using the technology of the blockchain. So I'm gonna run really, really fast on this, on why, on, on cryptocurrency as an asset. Uh, and how much time do I have at all? Two minutes. Two minutes, <laughs> which means I have one minute for each of the next 10 slides. Um, so very quickly, why is this important? Millennials, I'm the oldest of millennials, so uh, millennials you can see here is 1981, so I'm very proud to be the oldest of millennials, uh, but most millennials, are not just now starting to basically uh, save money. So most millennials until now didn't have spare money and they're just getting into their investable period. And millennials in generally are people who grew up already with Facebook and Google and blockchain is becoming a part of that when they're thinking about saving and investing. Uh, and this is just a note to a lot of people who think about crypto, they think, okay, it already rose uh, for, uh, uh, you know, 40 times or so, so maybe the rally is behind us. This is an example of how a generation can actually lift something up by even more. Uh, this is Japan going 10 times more after a rally of 40 times. Um, and what's important is that millennials are the biggest generation in the world, so we're the largest cohort of people in the world, and we're going to be the richest cohort of people in the world. So this is a very important generation. Uh, and our generation is just now starting to get some money to save and invest. And if you look at previous generation, every generation had his pick of a specific asset. So the silent generation picked gold as their asset. This was the safe haven of uh, the silent generation. The baby boomers bought equities, so they actually rose the entire capital markets in the US and in Japan, two of the biggest markets, I'm assuming also here in the UK, but I don't have that data. Uh, and you had Generation Xers who really, really liked hedge funds uh, until uh, Madoff sort of blew that. Uh, but they really liked hedge funds and grew this entire industry. And now a key question is, we already see millennials in a lot of surveys saying, we prefer holding cryptocurrencies and buying cryptocurrencies than stocks. So if they keep on doing that with more investable assets, then we're, we're way, way behind the potential rally of, again, a scarce commodity being bought by these people. And now if you're not a millennial, and you're saying, okay, I'm not a millennial, why should I buy it? Then the fact is a lot of people are afraid that this has no intrinsic value, but neither the really Facebook, Amazon, Apple, or Netflix, everything today is intangible and based on people using this technology. So the concept of book value and DCF doesn't work anymore, neither in the capital markets. And if you think about the store of value market, so high net individuals usually also have money in gold or collectible art or bonds, then Bitcoin is simply 0.1% of the entire store of value market. So there's still a very small fraction mm -hmm. of the digital store of value. Um, and just to say uh, two things about ICOs. So ICOs have been driving this. There are more than 2,000 currencies. And what we're actually be seeing now is the building a new global capital markets where there are companies from dozens of different countries raising money as an issuance of a new currency, that market cap today is about $400 billion, uh, which means it's about the number 20 stock market in the world. I expect it to be a top 10 stock market or crypto uh, stock market in the world. So from the amount of both market cap and volumes actually, it's even higher, which means uh, it's operating basically as a new form of capital markets. And last but not least, it's also important to say that this is not a correlated asset class. So for those of you who are afraid what will happen when the markets will crash, because we're at the all-time highs on equities, and at some point music stops and they crash, most people assume crypto markets are going to boom when that happens. 
Uh, and you can see here, for example, what happens when you have a portfolio that you own 50% stocks, 40% bonds, and then 5% Bitcoin and 5% other top 10 cryptocurrencies, which obviously generates uh, a significant additional return while actually reducing potentially the risk of the portfolio from pure financial modeling, which is very interesting. So if you buy in a portfolio, one to five percent of your assets in crypto, you're actually reducing the risk of the portfolio while maintaining potentially uh, added returns of cryptocurrency. So that's very important to understand from a portfolio management point of view. Um, and of course, I just said that because you can do that all the <laughs> uh, so this is uh, just an example of our crypto fund where you can with one click actually invest automatically in the te top 10 cryptos where through our copy fund we actually reallocate that on a market cap uh, weighted allocation once a month to make sure that you follow the entire crypto market or the entire top 10 uh, and we're building a lot of tools to do that so hopefully I have added some value while not being able to explain how blockchain works. <laughs> and now over to Maul, who is the founding partner of iAngels. Hi, good morning. So after that, I, I really was hoping Yoni would go first because I felt he kind of did all the hard work for me. So now we, we know a lot about how the industry works. And now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about iAngels, uh, what we are, how Israel is connected to this really vibrant ecosystem of uh, blockchain and, uh, uh, and in general what we've been doing in the VC space in the last five years. Um, so again, thank you so much Video for having us today and uh, Hugo for, from uh, UK Israel Business. Uh, it's really a pleasure being here every, every single time that we're invited. Um, as I said before, my name is Mor Asya, I'm founding partner of iAngels. And iAngels um, is uh, really a five-year-old company, an investment firm that is seated in the heart of uh, Tel Aviv, of, uh, where really everything is happening in Israel. Um, the capital of the startup nation, we have like, all the really most interesting uh, investors and uh, uh, companies sit there. Uh, we're a hybrid model between a VC and a platform. And what this really means is that we, we created a, a, a new model where we wanted to enable investors from all over the world to gain exposure, visibility, and insight of what's going on in Israel, where really the local investors are, are investing. Because I think everybody knows is that, um, uh, specifically in early stage companies, investors are hyper-local, and they're looking for businesses to support in their, in their uh, close environment. Um, and so when people from abroad wanted to engage with Israel and wanted to invest, what we wanted to do is enable them to do so with the industry insiders, with where the local uh, VCs and angel investors are investing, and this is what we set out to do. So we created a very interesting model where we created an online platform where investors from all over the world are able to log in and, and register and uh, look at our analysis as an investment firm, our due diligence memos, etc., and consider uh, uh, their footprint in investing in Israel and startup nation. And since since like three years ago, we've actually been investing in blockchain-related companies in the VC space. And so, in 2017, we were the best best positioned uh, to take advantage of the growth, the significant growth that we've been experiencing in blockchain tech. Uh, especially coming out of Israel, and so we've been uh, uh, creating a new line of business in 2017 to support uh, and, and, and broaden our mandate to invest in, in crypto assets and, and enable our investors to do so uh, as well. So we're managing about $140 million in AUM. We've invested in um, almost 100 companies. Our investors come from 45 uh, uh, main countries from all over the world. And we've are already had some exits. So this is really still a young portfolio. Um, we consider kind of like time horizon on investment from anywhere five to eight years, depending on the sector. Um, so for us already to have a few companies that have already gone through like full liquidation uh, processes is, uh, is something that is very interesting uh, for us and for our investors to, to, to understand. So this is just a little bit about our management team. We're actually a, a company that's uh, very special in the VC landscape in Israel, just merely from the fact that we're two female founders. 
um, in the VC industry in Israel, it's uh, considered odd, I guess, is it, is it in many other places in the world, but we're actually a female-dominated company. I actually uh, asked uh, maybe to, to highlight just our, our chairman, uh, David Asia, who's an angel investor and, and uh, uh, really one of the founding fathers of, uh, of uh, um, software in Israel. And the key theme is uh, enterprise software. And um, Shelley and myself who come from really complementary backgrounds. So I come from a tech and business background, 8200 80, graduate. Uh, I studied at the Technion Mathematics and Computer Science. Worked for many years as a software engineer, uh, pursued my MBA in, in at Columbia University in New York. So really had a very, very strong uh, background in technology and moved on to kind of like business and consulting before founding iAngels. And Shelly, my, my partner, we've been friends for many years. We actually met in New York. She comes from a, an investments uh, background. She worked for a hedge fund, Avenue Capital in New York, and uh, and actually managed to steal her away from Goldman Sachs in Israel, where she worked on her uh, on the investment banking uh, division for three years. So bringing that uh, a lot of uh, uh, discipline and best practices from the corporate side, being working for many years on these big organizations and blue chip companies, we're able to bring that kind of insight to our portfolio companies as we as we work together with them to help them grow and, and establish themselves. Now Israel. So everybody's been talking about Israel. There's really nothing new here. And we've had a, also uh, Hugo's uh, uh, video in the beginning. But just a few things that we might not uh, necessarily recognize. Beyond the fact that just Tel Aviv as a, as a, like a startup hub uh, is the home of uh, about 8,000 startups, which is the largest from, if you consider the amount of startups per, human, per capita in Israel, it's really the largest in the world. Eight million people live in, uh, in Israel and huge concentration of startups. And it's been almost like a joke that if the Jewish mom used to want her sons to be, or her daughters to be uh, lawyers and, uh, and doctors, uh, today having a son or daughter pursue uh, a computer science degree and, and become a startup CEO is really quite an, an accomplishment. So it's been, uh, we, we, we have a lot of companies, a lot of uh, people who are taking that risk and inherently have the DNA to, to, to start, a, start a startup company and take on that kind of risk. So it's a very exciting uh, ecosystem um, uh, that has been enjoying a lot of visibility from external uh, investors and, uh, and, and a lot of funding as well. So some of the success uh, it's driven by a, supported, a supportive, innovative uh, ecosystem. So there are many contributors to why Israel is what it is today. Um, and, and, and some of these factors are an inherent part of what our ecosystem is. So many, many times when we travel abroad, people ask us, okay, so how can we be Israel as well? How can, how can Sydney be a startup ecosystem? How could, uh, how could uh, uh, Frankfurt be a startup ecosystem? And there are so many things that started, it's not overnight, it's a real process, and there are many contributors to that, to that success. Um, these are just to name a few, we'll, we'll touch on some of these in, in the next slides. So startup nation state of, state of mind. So Israelis are real pioneers. We, we are happy to be early adopters, and we're happy to take a lot of risk. And this is something that's really inherent to, to our DNA, as I explained before. And that, uh, that really is an interesting factor, because we're not afraid to fail, or we're not afraid to take a risk and to, to do something that we have fairly limited visibility into the future. Or we have, uh, we're, we're happy to work in an environment where there's limited, uh, uh, limited uh, 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 data or support system. World-renowned academic institutions. So also interesting is that the uh, academic institutions that are the most prestigious in Israel are actually the government-supported uh, 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 institutions. So Tel Aviv University, uh, Technion, etc. These are not private schools. These are the public schools that are supported by the government. I did my uh, bachelor's degree in mathematics and computer science. It cost me less than $10,000 to do so, to be an engineer in Israel, in one of the top schools. So it's really different from what we see in other places in the world. And these, and I used, I studied at the Technion at the time that we won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. So very exciting times, incredible scientists, very strong academic institutions supporting a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs that are coming from the university. Supportive government. So there are a lot of government programs, incubation programs, acceleration programs. 
uh, grants that are provided by the government to support uh, R&D companies. So there are literally grants today, in the past it was mo mostly from chief scientists, grants uh, 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 support that was for equity, but today there are many, many grants that don't include any equity at all. You have an R&D expenditures in, in young startups, you're able to get a lot of breaks from the government, a lot of grants that help these companies get to the next milestone of funding with limited resources, relatively speaking. Uh, broad and diverse capital base. So we have acceleration programs, VCs, international funds, angel investors. Angel investors, as I said before, very strong and meaningful to early stage uh, companies. But not one type of investor can live without the other. And everybody has a role. Everybody has a specific role in the company life cycle. So global reach. Just think about the fact that a third of Israeli startups sell to com customers outside of their home. So it means that from the very first day, uh, <coughs> entrepreneurs need to think global. They need to come up with solutions for problems they don't necessarily have. They need to think about problems that other regions have or other customers have in, in different places of the world and think about adoption of their product, think about marketing to them, think about uh, communications. And this is all from a very, very small country that constantly thinks global from day one. So this is really also inherent to our business. Israel is never big enough. Israel is never the market for anything Israelis produce. Mature and robust ecosystem. So again, we've because all of the things that I just explained did not happen overnight. This has been work in process for many years now. So we've already had a lot of successes to come out of Israel. A lot of IPOs, $45 billion in M&A and IPO activity since 2014. Staggering amount. Eight out of, out of eight have every 100 startups reach a liquidation event, meaning an IPO or an M&A. Um, so that's really a very high ratio of success. Uh, for every $1 invested, $3 is returned on average. This, this uh, specific figure is talking about efficiency of, uh, of investment. So we know how to stretch our dollars to get to similar milestones as our international counterparts with limited funding and to produce comparable value or increased amount of value, which makes Israel a very capital efficient ecosystem. So Israel is a, is a magnet for tech uh, conglomerates. We have huge tech giants coming into Israel. Many of them acquire startups in Israel, and around those acquisitions form R&D centers in Israel. Um, these R&D centers are home for uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, scientists, and with that foot on the ground, they're even more prone to continue with this M&A activity, to, to found acceleration programs for, for uh, startups that are in operating their sectors, and this broadens even more our ecosystem and helps uh, companies uh, think about the way that these giants uh, uh, are considering innovation outside of Israel. Um, so these are some of the highlights as we, as angels, kind of like researched it. What are the really key themes that make Israel really special? So higher hit rate, we've talked about that. Lower valuation still, and this is derived by several factors. Um, one of them, for instance, is the fact that Israel is just a little bit more affordable than other places in the world, so engineers don't cost as much, rent doesn't cost as much, and so we're able to, uh, when when companies consider, you know, their kind of like seed round or even their A round, from a budget perspective, they're able to raise maybe less money, and then in return, the, com the companies that are uh, investing, the investors who are investing in these companies are able to enjoy still considerably lower valuation than some of their international counterparts. Higher capital efficiency is something that I spoke about earlier, but how do we make our dollars count? Or how do we make uh, progress at the next milestone count with the, the kind of like low resources that we have? And faster time to exit. And this has been changing over the recent years. Israel has, was somewhat uh, criticized about being fast to exit, or entrepreneurs being fast to exit, and then some of the value uh, is being uh, held still by the acquiring company. And we see a very uh, significant trend happening with uh, local entrepreneurs that many of them either sold a company or have been successful or going back to the drawing board and now are looking to build a significantly bigger business um, and potentially with their own uh, uh, leadership bring that company over to you know a, a stronger bigger IPO etc. Um, so this is something that Israel has been working on the last uh, few years about how do we make 
uh, uh, startup nation, that was exit nation, now uh, scale up nation or growth nation. So um, I am just really a, a hybrid VC and co investment platform. I want to talk a little bit about what we do exactly because what we do is we we look at about 100 companies every month, and we have our own kind of like proprietary process of how to screen opportunities and how to vet them. Um, we have one of the largest investment teams in Israel. We have over seven people full time working just on the investment side, um, and additional. Uh, resources from experts and advisors who are supportive of that due diligence process. Now, what we wanted to do is enable investors to either choose from the companies that we invest in and to be able to create a portfolio for, for themselves if based on uh, company stage or, uh, or sector, for instance. But we are also uh, enabling investors to create a portfolio that we manage for them. So many investors, they don't want to do it hands-on, they don't necessarily have a, you know, it's not their day job to, to, to do angel investors' investments, so we enable them to onboard a trap that's uh, considered a managed account, and they can decide from their you know, portfolio allocation what they want to allocate to these investments or to these investments in Israel, and we will enable them to, to manage that process seamlessly uh, over a course of time. Um, so it's a very unique model, um, and uh, um, I'm, I'm encouraging you to, to check some more information on our platform on uh, IHS.co to learn more about how we actually do this, and we can jump onto the next slide. So um, we've had the opportunity to really co-invest with a lot of the biggest names in the industry. Um, we actually are advocates of co-investment model for, for several reasons. Most, most important in my eyes is the fact that um, companies in the early stages, if they take it to, if they have a one strong investor only when they when they do their seed round, they're many times kind of hijacked by that investor. Um, if that investor uh, doesn't invest in the consecutive round in a meaningful way, everybody else says, okay, it's bad signal, signaling. Because if if it was such a great deal, that investor would have invested everything, and would have gone all into that company. If the company is raising money elsewhere, what does that mean exactly? Now, if you create a strong syndicate of investors, first you have more opinions around the table and a more significant and diverse board, but also as the company grows and goes through consecutive rounds of finance, there is kind of like a more dynamic uh, uh, contribution from different types of investors who have different uh, strategic value to the company and uh, 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 each and every one is uh, not solely responsible for the financing of the company for its <laughs> continuous success. And we've, we've been promoting the co-investment model in Israel amongst our uh, co-investment partners in Israel, but also abroad. We've had the opportunity to bring on board strategic investors uh, from, uh, some of them come from the INGES network actually, and some of them uh, are through relationships that we created over the years. And these are just a few names of top investment firms that we've collaborated with over the years. So now we're jumping off to kind of like the new light in business that I explained to you earlier and about our contribution and activity around blockchain tech. Now, the way that we see it, it's really every decade or so, some of uh, Yoni's slides actually depicted uh, even uh, further about how each generation uh, experiences different kinds of growth and how there's an opportunity for wealth creation uh, in each and every generation. And we believe we're really at that, at that point in time where blockchain tech is going to be the facilitator, facilitator for a considerable amount of growth uh, coming up. Some of the things that we discuss about the real kind of like game changers in the kind of technology is, uh, first of all, really the smart contract. For people who are more familiar with uh, computer science, it's kind of like an if or Excel, if then else kind of uh, statement which really changes the way developers develop on blockchain, but also uh, customers uh, 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 understand that. Because I don't want it just to be able to move one Bitcoin from uh, myself to you, but I want to move it if certain, certain uh, terms are met. And this is what we think is really creating a lot of the growth that we've been experiencing last year. These are some of the companies that are uh, active in the space, and we can already see uh, uh, the different sectors of activity. The way that I, I think about it 
is we're going to have somewhat, somewhat of a parallel world. We don't only have today uh, solutions in security, in uh, marketing, in gaming, in the real, in kind of like the real world, but these kinds of solutions or these kinds of vectors are developed also on, in the blockchain uh, uh, industry and have applications that are incredibly relevant to those sectors there as well. Now, this is, the, this is a time where there's significant opportunity for investors and entrepreneurs, uh, for investors to actually make money. And this is what you know, everybody's really interesting and interested in. And for entrepreneurs to, to even be able to take part of that considerable amount of growth. This is something that's very interesting. The re recent research that we did in, in, in iAngels about the Israeli, um, the Israeli uh, uh, ecosystem because if we look at 2017, so I'm not sure everybody understands exactly what an ICO means, but an ICO is similar to an IPO, but for uh, for generation of, uh, of a new token. And so there's some some level, like le uh, leveling out the playing field where investors from all over the world are able to participate in different, in different contribution uh, uh, pieces and take part in something that's previously considered relatively regional. So an IPO would be you know, either you IPO in London or you IPO in New York. When you do ICO, you have adoption from community all over the world. Now, if we want to look just at the ICO, because 2017 was really the year of the ICOs, there have been so many, there have been uh, uh, different types of uh, opinions about whether or not it's uh, uh, the right way to raise uh, capital or whether or not it's, uh, it's uh, an, honor, uh, like an honest way to raise capital. But if we look at the ICO funding in 2017, global markets uh, raised uh, $5.6 billion in uh, approximately 900 ICOs. The Israeli uh, ICO market raised $490 million in um, about, uh, I believe it was less than 90 ICOs. So we see Israel ICOs, Israeli ICOs are considerably more successful Considerably larger than uh, the, uh, the international counterparts, and that's really interesting. And not only was that uh, uh, was that a successful year in terms of Israeli ICOs, but also there is an evolution there. In a very short period of time, just one year, we saw companies moving from potentially raising very aggressive, very large uh, goals for their ICOs, like 50 or 100 million dollars, to now doing something that's more conservative. It's more backed by real technology, by real uh, uh, assets that already exist, and, uh, and just consider it a little bit more kind of like maturely. We see Israel as a, as, a, as a hub that does that really well. So a lot of the entrepreneurs that we invested in, and I just invested in, in 2017 and 2018 are people who are PhDs that are you know, exploring this space for many years, uh, fintech entrepreneurs who have been successful. Um, the white papers are a lot more uh, uh, meaty and have real teams and technology to back it. And so, in hand, um, their ICOs are, are more successful. So this is also goes to show how, how um, there is a gravitation of fintech investment flowing into blockchain, and especially in Israel. If we consider VC investments into the fintech space in recent years, there's actually been a significant decline. But if we look at the blockchain investment uh, space, we see a huge amount surge uh, of money flowing into blockchain investments in Israel. Now, this uh, slide actually depicts somewhat about something about our investment strategy into blockchain tech. We, uh, when we consider the internet or, or the web and blockchain as we see it today, there is a, di a significant difference between where the capture of value uh, lies. So the internet, there's a very thin protocol layer, the HTTP, and the people who actually made the most amount of money were the people who were successful in developing strong applications on top of that, like the Googles and Facebooks of the world. Now in blockchain, it's actually reversed, and there's a very thick protocol layer that's, de that's devised from the fact that it's uh, decentralized, that it's open source, et cetera, and it leaves less room for application layer value to be created. So we're now at the stage where the protocol layer is still being solidified. There are a lot of developments going on in the protocol layer, and, uh, and, and, and people and investors actually have the opportunity to take a big, a big chunk of value from that protocol layer and become early investors 
in what is going to support later uh, uh, applications that are going to come. Just think that there is no killer app on Ethereum yet, there are limited applications on Bitcoin, etc. So that's going to be the next stage, but still the most amount of value is going to rely on the protocol layer, which is our focus of investments in that case. Um, it's something that I thought was really interesting, and we're going to try to uh, pick it up from uh, uh, that to the end. So tokenization is really the next wave of equity crowdfunding. Equity crowdfunding is something that in the UK is very, very, uh, 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 people here are very familiar with uh, crowdfunding. But it, 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 I like it because it, mean, it means similar ways, kind of like the vote of, you know, of what everybody wants to do, some sort of, of level of, uh, of uh, sharing of information and sharing a willingness to participate that is very similar in that respect. Um, we value, the way that we look into opportunity is very similar to the way that we look at VC opportunities. And this is really where we created a new line of business that's focusing on uh, investments in crypto assets. Because when we look in, 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 in kind of like our, our traditional VC, we want to look at the team, the technology, we want to look at valuation analysis, exit scenario analysis. Uh, we want to make sure that you know the business model is sound, the pricing, etc. These are all things that we consider on our VC uh, investments. But it's also very similar when we consider a blockchain uh, deal or, or, or even investing in a token. We want to see how the team works instead of a business model or or, uh, or investor presentation. There is a white paper. There is still technology that needs to be validated. There is a market and, and, and community that needs to you know to be early adopters of that technology. So we really see a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh, 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 connection between the two types of analyses. So, um, as Yanni said, also we we also believe that uh, crypto assets are hedging, kind of like your, your portfolio. And there's a lot of room for that within a financial portfolio uh, uh, construction. Um, and we encourage you to learn more about our research and, and the way that we that we invest. Um, and, and just to to make sure that we that we. Uh, 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 that we consider crypto assets as part of our overall uh, financial portfolio. That's it. Uh, I would uh, very much uh, like to see each and every one of you register with us and learn more about what we do, uh, how to invest in VC in Israel, and how to invest in crypto in Israel and abroad. Uh, thank you so much. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Starts a little bit on the sort of bringing it back to the UK first, and then we'll go into blockchain again. So, I mean, Yoni, you obviously, Itaro has operations in the UK, you have people here. I mean, talk to us a little bit about the perspective of an, of an Israeli founder coming to the UK with both, and you know, what you're seeing here. Um, well, first of all, the UK is the largest market for Itaro, uh, followed by, uh, by Europe, Germany, at least Spain. So, it's a very important market for us. Um, I have to say that as an Israeli, we initially thought we spoke the language. We realized that we don't. Um, and, uh, English, you mean? Yes. <laughs> British. Uh, uh, and we've gradually built a team here, so we have about 30 people in Canary Wharf, um, to really help us sort of bridge that. Uh, it, I don't think it's a it's, uh, it's consumer expectation difference between Israel or how we see things to how things should be done here in the UK, a higher class, a higher quality. Um, so it's a very interesting sort of uh, experience. I think we as a firm, while we're still relatively, how many people here are familiar with eToro before I came here? So we're a relatively familiar brand. Um, I think for us it's still a, an effort, which by the way I invite anyone here in the room to also help us with that effort to make people feel like eToro is a UK brand uh, and is equivalent to the UK brands in our space. And Limor, you have, I think, 75 companies in your portfolio. I mean, historically, Israeli startups look straight to the US as their first global market. Are you seeing a change in terms of some of them looking at the UK first? Is it something you're encouraging? Talk to us about the attitudes of your founders in terms of and how they see the Okay, so it's very interesting on, on multiple levels. First, I, I agree. I mean, it, they, the, when companies coming out of Israel consider their first or their pr 
primary uh, go-to market. They do look at the U.S. as, as a large as a large uh, market to tackle. But I think over the course of the last years, there are also many challenges. It's highly competitive. Um, even if Israelis, they have a, a great idea, they need, they also need kind of like an American team on the ground, which is very expensive, limited resources, doesn't always, uh, 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 it's not always possible before their AOB round. Um, and then always the local player can, you know, can grow very fast out of, uh, out of uh, the US. Now, Israelis are now looking incredibly more at Europe and Asia. As, as the first go-to markets as well. And at our portfolio, we have many companies that are targeting uh, Europe and are looking at the UK as the bridge to Europe or as the first market when they want to, when they want to start to tackle the, the European uh, uh, market. Uh, and it's fairly easy, it's very close in proximity, time difference, et cetera. There are many, many benefits of coming here. And I think the last kind of like part of the puzzle that still remains is how do local UK investors what can participate in that kind of uh, in that kind of um, facilitation? Because if there's there's going to be more activity on that front, that's going to encourage a lot more uh, companies to come here as a, as a first go-to market. I guess I have to ask now, given you've talked about the UK as a base for Europe, the Brexit question. I mean, what do you see your companies still thinking of the UK as that primary base for accessing Europe, basically? Um, well, well, for us today, the UK is sort of our hub for Europe. I don't really see the changing. Um, there is, of course, a question of whether... So I think one key area that uh, more Israeli startups are sort of initially coming to the UK is their first go-to market is FinTech. FinTech is a, is a very is a growing space, uh, and, and in general, Europe and UK relations are, are uh, better and easier than the US for a lot of Israeli firms. Um, so I think there's a big question regarding whether it's going, the Brexit is going to break the sort of pan-European plus UK financial regulation or not. We really hope it doesn't. Um, so we can keep on onboarding UK clients into our FCA regulated entity. Um, so that's one key question. Uh, today we're still relatively comfortable at looking at the UK as the main hub, but there are still many questions that we don't know answers to regarding the Brexit. Um, so, but our, our business also thrives in volatility, so at least it increases that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say something similar. I think Israelis, uh, they thrive at times of like uncertainty. And uncertainty uh, in the market presents an opportunity as well. And because Israelis can be fast movers and they can, you know, they're very agile, uh, the strong teams will know how to navigate. And I agree, we don't have full clarity on how everything's going to pan out, but I see the same amount of interest, if not more, uh, for companies looking at the UK these days than, you know, than ever before. That's certainly a positive sign. Um, moving on to blockchain, I think, more you put up a slide talking about the application and protocol layers and how really the whole is the protocol side with blockchain that is yet to be built and being built. I mean, you know, we've seen already blockchain exam applications outside finance in terms of verifying things like diamonds, fine wine, music, health, smart contracts, and so forth. Um, I mean, moving forward, I mean, what industries do you see being built around blockchain? I guess this is a question for both of you. You have different perspectives on this and different angles, but maybe more of you could say. Yeah, I think anything, and, and, and this intrigues me, me, by the way, because I'm, 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 I always think about uh, when I see companies about why does this company specifically need the blockchain or what kind of value, uh, uh, added value is, is being uh, uh, provided by this company pursuing you know, blockchain. Um, and, and I think we'll see more and more of that. And of course, for anything that has a di di digital application or anything has to do with uh, dig digital uh, engagement, there is a real benefit uh, and, and opportunity to, to create that around blockchain. Um, we see things, you know, just things that we see today, even things in government, uh, like uh, DAOs, decentralized uh, uh, organizations, uh, a lot of infrastructure built around that. We actually invested in DAO stack that recently uh, ICO, they, they completed their ICO in 66 seconds. Um, very successful PhD from Technion, a very strong team. So, um, so definitely things around how do we construct uh, organizations, 
how do we uh, construct a, a solution for security solutions and, and cyber solutions. Um, so these two sectors I think are interesting. Anything financial, how to create different types of financial products. We invested also in a company called Firmo Networks that really created uh, um, uh, a way for, for people to be able to construct different financial uh, interactions and, and products across different types of blockchain. So, so there are many activities around these fronts that we feel are really exciting. Do you have anything to add? I can't tackle that. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, we're sitting here in a firm of accountants, and I mean, do you think in five or ten years' time, once blockchain is prolific, they will actually have a need to exist in the way that they do today? I mean, where do you see things like professions going in this way? I think it, it, it could take longer maybe than five years, um, but I mean, a whole, an entire shift. But I think in general, blockchain is an auditing mechanism uh, and for audit firms not to consider that uh, would be staying behind and the market structure is is actually relatively convenient so you still need someone to audit a smart contract to understand how a smart contract works you still need someone to audit the blockchain to, to look at movements but instead of quarterly it's in real time so ideally not pay per hour of audit um, but uh, so, but this completely changes eventually. So for an ICO company, if it manages all of its books, revenues, etc., as a token economics, it completely changes how you audit that company. What do you need to audit? What does the token holders are? There, are they stakeholders? Do they require uh, audit company to report to them about something? So my shareholders own shares in eToro, so they know I have an audit firm that audits my financial statements. A token company, does it need any third party to audit its economics? So I, I think it's a very, it's a brave new world uh, of IC, the, the ICO space. I think we're still at very initial stages, but I expect in 2018 we already know that EY uh, and are working on a smart contract auditing, so I'm seeing others as well. So definitely this will have a very big and significant impact into all of the uh, sort of uh, um, auditing force. Can, can I just understand that? So you're saying that at some point in the future, it's not just the company will be raising money by ICOs, it's actually it's the right. revenues and the costs and all of that will actually be uh, on the budget. Totally. Got it. Okay. Um, I think that also um, it's fascinating to consider also now the kind of like the uh, talks about AI and that and how that is uh, uh, chiming into changing the world as we know in terms of potential future roles or uh, uh, of the world or the world of employment. I think in collaboration with blockchain, there's going to be a real change in you know for instance the way the world that our children are. Know, growing into and the types of roles they will take, the type, types of education they will need to face kind of like the new type of work environment that exists, how work is valued. So we'll have full organizations that are uh, uh, maybe working completely remote. Uh, people who have who receives uh, specific jobs to fulfill and they know exactly what they're going to be paid on per job and that specific job is going to be a small part uh, of uh, a, a bigger piece of code. So we're going to have people from all over the world be contributors of slices of code being paid on the blockchain uh, completely decentralized way and, and, and that's going to form a, a, a new type of work environment, a new type of skill set. Um, and so I, I do believe it's going to take a little bit more than five years. But I think by the time like our children are going to hit the, the workforce, this is definitely going to be the reality as I see it. I'd actually like to ask my next question around that. I mean, I was at a talk um, a few months ago with Yuval Noah Harari, and, he, and um, he was talking really about the way if you started a degree today, by the time you've completed that degree, it's almost going to be irrelevant. I mean, you two are parents of four young children, and I mean, what skills do you think your children need and that you need to equip them with to be in the working world later? You know, There's it's one very skill we grew up with that our people have always excelled in and uh, uh, will still be very efficient, it's trade. 
<laughs> so uh, that's going to be here to stay um, because it's relatively very simple uh, degree from buy low sell high uh, and all the rest of the things. So, uh, so, so commerce is, is going to stay there. So I, I, I've read and heard all about employment is going to disappear, no more taxi drivers, no more this, no more this. There's always going to be something cheap to buy and so it's more expensive. So that's important for, for, the, for the business uh, point of view. But I do think that we are moving towards a more computer sciences led uh, uh, society, hopefully. So we still see a lot of companies that you ask how many people here have a degree in computer sciences or in mathematics, and you have, I, will, I met the Central Bank of England, uh, and they don't have any computer scientists, surprisingly. Um, that's going to change. So, uh, we're going to see many more people who have the ability to communicate with machines. So we're building those very strong machines. We need more people to help us communicate with them so they don't become our overlords. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I agree. I think for, for our children, we try to make sure that they get a, a good amount of you know, the basics and, uh, of course, strong like, kind of like mathematical science. That's why we insist four hour of iPad every day for us. <laughs> <laughs> They're gamers. They're all gamers. So, uh, I mean, there are still young. I think there's yeah. a lot, uh, you know, there's still time before they have to go to college. <coughs> but I'm, sh I'm convinced that, you know, computer science is going to be fundamental. It's, it, it might even be built into other, uh, other uh, uh, um, uh, academic programs as well, because I think it's really a lot of the essence, even to be able to code it like a smart contract. Although today there are many software languages that are kind of like pseudocode, they look we'll exactly like English. Say we're more computer scientists, yeah. so maybe. Yeah. So I don't know if it's exactly yeah. it's, a, it's the same for everyone, for everything. Yeah. But I think it's 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 it, it is a fundamental uh, uh, skill that uh, I would like uh, our our children to to really master. Maybe doctors is also important. I mean, I've, 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 again, like I've literally just spoke with an entrepreneur in Israel and, and that, that is building a, a whole process for uh, emergency rooms that is going to be completely automated and, and constructed by robots. So some of it is, but I think I think the ability to think or to teach machines how to think is still going to be uh, something that's very meaningful and mostly something that's, that's inherent in kind of like an entrepreneurial skill. Uh, agility, uh, being able to execute outside of your comfort zone, uh, being able to try to anticipate, you know, several steps forward, ability to consider other other geographies and regions, and being an international uh, uh, kind of like a member of, of community, I think is very important, and, and, and this is going to all feed right into whatever workforce we're going to have. You know, it's going to look like. One last question for me before we throw it open to the floor. I mean, I think probably more from Yoni in terms of the crypto um, side of things. I mean, back in at the end of December, early January, we saw a crypto bubble almost. We saw Bitcoin double in value in a matter of days. We saw things like Ethereum go from 50 cents to three dollars. I mean, I was in Australia. And my, I had my mother-in-law trying to tell me I need to buy crypto. I need to buy Ethereum. I need to buy Ripple. How do I do it? How do I do it? I was just like, look. Tell you go on to guitar and I'm not touching it myself, I'm not going to invest for you. I mean, when my mother in law is telling me that she wants to buy crypto, is that a bubble? I mean, what's your view on that? Or are we just seeing, First we've of, seen a correction we, since? We have seen a correction, but I think we've seen something really marvelous. Um, I mean, I've, I've, the only time I've seen something even uh, just you know, closely resembles what we've seen in December was the dot-com bubble. Um, now, now, bubbles are something interesting. So first of all, bubbles and busts are just the way the market works. Uh, so it's a core infrastructure of the market. But I think when you think of a lot of people from all around the world going in and trying to buy an asset and that asset appreciates, um, then you know it's, it's very interesting that it happened globally. You saw it all around the world. In my point of view, this is not the end, so this was not a bubble and it crashed. We're going to see a bigger rally. Again, this is my personal opinion, not investment advice. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think 
we are just at the sort of, we saw the first bubble which was very retail driven. The second bubble is going to be retail plus institutional driven. So we are talking to a lot of big banks, uh, groups like Goldman Sachs, Fidelity, uh, we're talking to a lot of billionaires. They have all stayed out of the first bubble because they were scared of the bubble. Um, and they, they looked at it and waited for it to blow up and it actually blew up so it made them took a step away. Um, but not, but, and it was very hard for someone to buy a million dollars, ten million dollars or a hundred million dollars of cryptocurrency for either a financial institution or if you're a billionaire. It, it was actually hard. It wasn't a simple thing to do. I think moving six months ahead for to, to, to today or you know twelve months till December, I think gradually more and more infrastructure is being built. You can call today Goldman and say, I want the cryptocurrency desk, give hit me with fifty million dollars, you'll get it. And that's what Fidelity needs to create an instrument for their clients to be exposed to that market. So and also regulators seem to be actually more and more positive. People thought about US ban, no US ban, South Korea ban, no South Korea ban. UK seems positive. So all of the developed countries are seem very positive. So in general, I'm very bullish on the market. Another disclaimer, I'm very exposed to the market. <laughs> um, how many people here think they're going to increase their exposure into crypto either from zero to something or from what they have to have more cryptocurrencies in the next 12 months? That's the reason for me to be like optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Am I allowed to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I guess it would be good to probably throw questions open to the floor. So. Yeah, I, I thought I understood the uh, blockchain technology, the, the concept of it, but I've got a couple of questions. First of all, does every currency, presumably, has its own, every cryptocurrency uses a different blockchain? No, there's two types of uh, cryptocurrencies. One are the blockchains, so Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, all of those who trade on eToro, for example, today are, are their own blockchain. Uh, but most of ICOs are being done for non-blockchain tokens. So sometimes people differentiate between the term cryptocurrency and a token. When you do an ICO, an initial coin offering, and raise money, that's usually for tokens. Those tokens usually don't have their own blockchain. They usually trade on Ethereum. So you can trade, I even did that in a 45 minute lecture, I actually showed how during that lecture, I set up, open my computer, write the code to issue a new currency, trade that currency, and move it from one computer to another. So it's extremely easy on Ethereum to issue a new type of token. It's much more complex to try and build your own blockchain. Okay, and the other question I've got uh, is that if it takes eight minutes to update, how could it be an instant transaction? Um, so Ethereum takes 17 seconds, EOS is going to take one second, if so only one transaction can be done in that period, otherwise it, it, it can't be, otherwise they're going to be, there's going to be conflict between in, in the blockchain. No, no, so, so you can have multiple transactions, thousands of transactions every eight minutes. It's going to be every eight minutes. But, but, but the confirmation, so I can send you the money, I can send you the money, you can see immediately that you got the money from me, you'll get the money, you'll get a confirmation that the money is in your account only after eight minutes. So the equivalent in the banking system is yeah. T plus one is two days. I was going to say, how long does it take you to wire five hundred dollars to your brother in a different I, I, bank? I, I so it, so so, so it's only saying. it's only the confirmation. It's only wire approval. It's only settlement takes the yeah. eight minutes. The block is the settlement. When you buy something with a credit card, it's thirty day settlement, right? So the cycles of Visa and Mastercard are, are thirty days. This is eight minutes. So it's still much, much faster. Yeah, it's more about uh, Israel as a place to do business. Uh, perhaps relative to London, what is the cost of great tech talent and indeed office space? Where in Israel? Yeah, here. in Israel. Well, it depends. Like strong uh, engineers that come from a specific uh, vertical, you would like to hire them in and be able to like retain them. You like the good ones cost like approximately forty thousand shekels, which is. A month. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Or even more, it depends. Salaries, salaries are almost identical in tech, Israel and the UK. Right. Um, uh, professional services are much, much more expensive in the UK. Um, and, um, right. and, and sales, so, so everything is more expensive in the UK other than tech. Thank you very much. Warm. <laughs> <laughs> That's also more expensive than you. Sure. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the issues I think a lot of people have struggled with is um, the, um, the safety in terms of money laundering and the fact that uh, there's a huge anti-money laundering culture, particularly in the UK, between professional classes. I'm a lawyer, and my firm spends half its life dealing with money laundering issues before we even start to open a file, it's a nightmare. Um, one of the things that's on our wall in every kitchen and every common space office is cryptocurrencies, beware. Um, there's a whole list that gets sent out by the law society, beware. I have How are you going to go over this? There's a uh, uh, very this short, um, because it's a, it's a big topic. First of all, most money laundering in the world is done in dollars. That's obvious, right? Uh, then secondly, I would distinctly separate which, what I think is not separated properly in money laundering rules between uh, tax reporting and cr real to terrorist finance. If somehow those two go together. I don't think they should be together. Um, now, regarding there are a lot of new technologies Russia looking we're now implementing some of them we're working with some of them so blockchain is a, is a transparent ledger so it's actually significantly more transparent than what you have with uh, traditional uh, regular money right so especially cash so with cash you can do anything so there is more and more and more controls over cash you get a client who came with a suitcase of a hundred thousand pounds in cash you would be very concerned in theory, because the blockchain is completely transparent, there are systems today to be able to tell you when you get Bitcoin from a client, you can actually look at the track record of that Bitcoin and see whether it's a clean Bitcoin. The whole trail so, where so, it was. so you can see the trail of the Bitcoin, its origination, if whether that's a good Bitcoin or a bad Bitcoin. Um, again, these are still very nascent technologies, but in theory, again, much, much more efficient than uh, dollars and banks, right? So if you work with a client and that client is a dentist, maybe that dentist has another client who's a Mexican drug lord, you won't, and, and he pays him via cash, and then the dentist pays you, nobody would think that you're somehow colluding w with a Mexican drug lord or are related to that transaction and you're not. The reason blockchain scares banks is because if you did all of that in, in, on the blockchain, there's a direct link now between you and, and, and the Mexican because you can actually see that the money transferred from him to the dentist to you. Which, That's if you're a financial institution, that might mean you, you have more, actually more risk. You have more risk because the system is actually more open which, again, in, in my opinion, it is a fallacy. P people need to understand that you can't expect the blockchain, because of its transparency, to have more controls because you can't control it. Again, having said that, if you are doing real money laundering, it is a big mistake to do it on cryptocurrencies. It's really easy to hire smart people and find out what you're doing. A good example for that was Silk Road. There's a great book about it, how they found the people who did Silk Road. Um, because everything, you, again, you can sort of pinpoint everything. Um, do the existing rules uh, or, or regulations, are, are they fit to handle that properly and to make sure that you're not at risk dealing with cryptocurrencies? No, you're at risk and rules might change also retroactively and create additional risk to you because of that level of transparency connecting you to everybody transacting in the blockchain. I want, to say, yeah, I want to say a few words additionally on kind of like investing in, in, in those kinds of assets. Uh, because, well, for us, for instance, all of our investors are accredited investors. We actually do all the KYC AML processes with them as well. Um, we've done that for our VC business as well as for, for people who are looking to invest in blockchain. 
Uh, but we see with companies who are actually raising ICOs, it's, it's not as completely open and, 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 and uh, not properly or professionally managed as you would think. It's super, super carefully managed. Everybody that wants to participate in the ICO has to go through whitelisting, has to go through KYC and AMO before their uh, investment is actually processed and approved. Uh, even funds, of course, individuals. So to be able to participate, you have to go through the, that entire process when you are participating in an ICO. And the companies who are leading the ICO, they know, they said not, not only is it, is it important for us to do these things properly and to have all the documentation and support to show that we, that we conducted ourselves professionally having raised 100 or 200 or 850 million dollars, um, but also they assume that the regulators are going to come knocking. They know, they're like not only assuming we're literally opening the door and welcoming them in, and they're happy, they can happily look at our books because everything is being done very professionally and, and well, well organized. Uh, if it's not done so, I would probably not invest in that ICO to begin with. But you see a lot more ICOs uh, uh, um, uh, raise considerable amount of their ICOs in a pre-sale, it's a private sale that looks exactly like a VC uh, investment would look like with all these uh, processes well in place, lawyers and everything very, very much mapped out and then they leave out uh, uh, an additional part for, for a, a crowd sale. I'm very conscious we said we'd wrap up at 10 o'clock and it's now a little bit later than that. So it might be better if we kind of continue the conversation over with the coffee. So if people obviously want to leave, thank you very thank you much. So much.